Hey, uh, we're going to talk about the UK and US regulators examine Microsoft's ties to OpenAI, and then we're going to jump into um, OpenAI's preparedness plan. Um, my name is Jordan Thibodeau, I'm running solo today. I used to work at M&A at Google, and uh, let's jump into this. So the UK Competition and Markets Authority on Friday said it has begun in information gathering process. This was on, written on December 8th, uh, you know, the same team that blocked the Figma deal. Um, uh, and a necessary precursor to a formal investigation that's likely to begin next year. So they're going through due diligence, seeing if they can dig up any information. Um, the, C, the CMA has decided to investigate and is inviting comments, the agency said. The U.S. Federal Trade Commission is also looking into Microsoft's investment in the company, OpenAI that is, according to a person familiar with the matter. Although no formal investigation has been launched, the agency declined to comment. Um, I... I don't see any value in what they're doing right now. I think the uh, AI market is very competitive. You have open source models coming out. You have what Facebook's doing. You have Anthropic. You have Mistral. Um, you have what Google's doing. There's a lot of a lot of competition in the market. The CMA on Friday said it has asked uh, the two companies, as well as any interested parties, such as competitors and customers, whether the partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI, including recent developments, has resulted in a relevant merger situation. The deadline to comment is January 3rd. And I'm sure competitors will come out there and say, yes, yes, you know, now the fact that Microsoft almost made an offer to, like, um, acquire uh, employees from OpenAI and all the support they're giving them, it's going to make things very tough for us, and we think that there should be a further investigation. Now, if the CMA came out and said they think this is a merger and they want to they want to block this, and they want to uh, change the relationship between uh, Microsoft and OpenAI, it'd be interesting because uh, another uh, German regulatory committee looked at the curtain curtain deal and partnership and said there's no merger here. Everything's good. Um, but if the CMA said, yeah, you should be doing this partnership, it would be interesting to see how Microsoft reacts. Microsoft say, okay, we're then going to do not just add, we're not going to allow micro, uh, 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 the Microsoft Copilot powered by OpenAI to be used in the UK or other countries. I mean, I guess they could possibly do that, but I don't know what that gains UK citizens. It's like, great. We have access to less technology. I feel so much better now. Um, the CMA on Friday said it has asked the two companies as well as any interested party. Such Okay, I read that already. Uh, the CMA, which this year locked horns with Microsoft over its $75 billion acquisition of video games maker Activision Blizzard, has become a formidable obstacle to big tech's deal-making in recent years. Antitrust enforcers in Brussels and Washington has also, has also indicated they are watching developments in the AI market closely. Yeah, I saw that, saw that Activision acquisition, and I was just like, one of the main hiccups people were talking about is like Call of Duty. Is Microsoft going to say it's only going to be on Xbox platform? What about PlayStation and the rest of them? Um, if anything, as someone who loves Blizzard and has seen how Activision has basically destroyed the company, I was praying, okay, Microsoft's now in charge. They have deep enough pockets. Hopefully they'll be able to resuscitate life into that IP and not hurt it and hopefully not go full Disney like how Disney went, to my, went towards Star Wars and completely destroyed it. Um, over the course of this year, Microsoft has enmeshed OpenAI's open artificial intelligence technology into many of its products, including its Office Works uh, workplace software, Bing search engine, and GitHub coding service, triggering a race across Silicon Valley to deploy generative AI in all manners of applications. Um, if the CMA's angle is to, to also maybe make an argument, I mean, one, looking at mergers, looking at if this is a merger or not, which it isn't, or Two, saying this is a potential anti-competitive bundling issue by having the co-pilot in Microsoft services. I think, again, that's going to be a disservice for um, tech enthusiasts in the European market who will probably face a reality where they might not be able to directly pipe in co-pilot into their Microsoft suite of services. And then if they did this to Microsoft, then they should do the same to Google and decouple Gemini from uh, G Suite, which... I'm not suggesting they should, but if they do this to Microsoft and OpenAI, they should logically do it to Google. And I think that would just be a loss in every direction for um, Europeans who want to use the best AI technology. Among the CMA's first task at this stage of such an investigation is to establish whether it has jurisdiction to review a deal. 
That can depend on factors including the size of the investor's share, shareholdings, its ability to influence decision making, or the strategic direction or change in control. Yeah, there was no change in control. Um, only thing that could have possibly happened if, if Sam wasn't allowed to come back to OpenAI, then the employees would have joined him possibly at Microsoft or another organization. But um, Microsoft didn't get I would would not get IP out of that scenario. They'd only be like be get, getting employees. Um and so there's no physical change of control of open AI. So their legal grounds is very hazy because if open AI employees want to quit and go join Microsoft, I, that's that's nothing that is related to a change in control or a merger. Um let's then go to the next point. Uh, last month before OpenAI's boardroom uh, ructions, the German con competition authority determined that Microsoft's alliance was not subject to merger control. The Bundeskarn... <laughs> okay, everyone can laugh. Please, the Germans in the audience, please tell me how to pr pronounce this properly. Uh, said it would re-examine the case if Microsoft were to increase its influence on, the, on, on OpenAI in the future. So the Germans already looked at this and they say, nope, not merger. So I would expect the CMA to, to go away. If anything, this is just like a distraction for open AI. So yikes. Um, let's go to preparedness. So this is from, this is December 18th. Now it's really interesting that this is released 10 days after um, the uh, previous story uh, with the UK and US regulators. This one happened December 8th. So part of me is thinking that there is kind of, I mean, it could be a coincidence, but also, you know, a lot of the, uh, people who think OpenAI is going too fast and are concerned that Helen Tover and some other people left the board are making con probably raising concerns of who's in control of OpenAI. Are they going to ramp up? Are they going all in? And if I was internally working at OpenAI, I would be kind of in this you know damage control and saying, okay, hey, we need to release more stuff on alignment and say how we're still like going slow on things. So we had super alignment released a couple of days ago. And now we get this preparedness um, uh, post happening. So, see, I mean, for it to be a coincidence, mm, I don't know about that. But I'd love to hear what you all think in the comment section. So, preparedness: the study of frontier AI risk has fallen short of what is possible and where we need to be to address this gap and synth systematize our safety thinking. We are adapting the initial version of our preparedness framework. It describes OpenAI's process, attract, evaluate, forecast, and protect against catastrophic risks posed by increasing powerful models. So this seems very transparent. That's just cool. The preparedness team is dedica dedicated to making frontier AI models safe. I guess frontier models are going to be the newest models for like GPT-5, GPT GPT-6, things like that. We have several safety and policy teams working together to mitigate risks from our AI. Our safety systems team focuses on mitigating misuse of current models and products like ChatGPT. The super alignment uh, team builds foundations for the safety of super intelligent models that we hope to have in a more distant future. So I, you hear people saying like AGI 2024, uh, Q is going to be Skynet. And they're basically like inferring here, no, Q was not AGI. No, we don't have like super intelligence yet. Um, so like calm down. The preparedness team maps out the emergency, emerging risks of frontier models, and it connects to safety systems, super alignment, and our safety and policy teams across OpenAI. So the three safety teams, safety systems, preparedness, super alignment, so current models, basically alignment training, stuff like that, frontier models, like, okay, let's keep probing these models, let's be prepared, let's test them before they go out to the market and see if there's any emergent, emergent um, like properties or it picks up a new abilities and functions that they didn't think would happen. And then super alignment in super intelligent models is something far out there. Uh, preparedness should be driven by science and grounded in facts. I love this. We are investing in design and execution of rigorous capability evaluations and forecasting to better detect emergency, emerging risks. In particular, we want to move the discussions of risk beyond hypothetical scenarios to concrete measurements and data-driven predictions. Wow. How incredibly novel. So instead of just hearing like, you know, people going crazy and saying, okay, well, obviously Skynet's going to happen or, okay, the paperclip scenario, I haven't thought about that. Or, okay, what if we trap AI in a box, eventually it's going to kill us all. Nope. Let's focus on what we have today. We have LLMs, which are fantastic and is the greatest thing I have ever seen in my history in computers. Like the fact that you can give it unstructured data, just ask it random questions and it can deal with the messiness of life and give you an answer that's going to help you, like, 
this is fantastic. And if I told Joe and I told you all here on the show, if progress stopped today on what we have, I still would consider this an overall revolution in computing. And I think for us, you who watch the show, we're all tip of the spear. So we see the LLMs now. We're probably like, oh, yeah, you know, we know the functionality. Well, what's going to happen tomorrow? We forget that like most government organizations, most large companies, medium-sized companies, even our society hasn't fully embraced these LLMs yet. They haven't fully penetrated yet. A lot of companies don't even have access to ChatGPT internally. So we haven't fully seen saturation yet of these models. So there's a lot of great stuff to come. Um, so let's go back. Uh, uh, we also want to look beyond what's happening today to anticipate what's ahead. This is so critical to our mission that we're bringing our top technical talent to this. We bring builders' minds to safety. Our company is founded on tightly coupling science and engineering, and the preparedness framework brings that same approach to our work on the safety. We learn from real-world deployment and the use lessons to mitigate emergency risks. Hey, shot, shots fired at Google. I'm also going to say sweep the leg. Sweep the leg. No mercy. Because Google was, you know, they had great models that were locked up. Uh, for the longest time, and they would just do AI thirst traps and say, oh, look how great this technology is, but you can't have it yet because it's got to go through more AI ethics reviews. You know, there might be African killer bees on Mars that could get offended about what happens, or someone could type something to it and it will respond slightly inappropriately. And that's the reason why, you know, that mother who was sick and trying to find a cure to her kid's disease, that's why we're not going to allow her to have access because we're worried about African killer bees on Mars. Um, that was kind of a it's kind of a straw man, but what we're seeing these LLMs, they are not sentient. They're not AGI. They don't have power sinking tendencies. You try to run them in a loop and pretty soon they are going to fall off the rails unless you have it narrowly scoped on what their roles are and what they're doing. But they still need a lot of human handholding, but they are still the greatest thing I've seen in computing so far. And they're still awesome. But um, I like how it says we learn from real world deployment and the, use the lessons to mitigate emerging risks. Google was saying, hey, we're going to keep this locked up, and we're going to have a team of people who just think of every possible use case, use case for abuse to the point that we can't launch anything. And if you remember in the, uh, oh, the great book of Kevin Scott, ooh, uh, the inside story of Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI, there was a point where when they had a GPT-4 version inside Microsoft, they ran it through the AI ethicist teams and they came back and they were like, well, uh, what about uh, the fact that uh, if we ask a generated image um, about uh, and ask it about COVID, it shows empty store shelves. And like Kevin Scott was like, uh, did you go to any stores during COVID when it first happened? Because I did. And I remember when I was in Q1 2017, I went to saw a lot of stores, empty shelves. And I was like, oh my God, like, thank God this will never happen in America. And then COVID happened. And so the AI ethicists are saying, well, we shouldn't release this because it's gonna, people are going to see the images and they're idiots and so they're going to start another run on food again. And it's like, no, people are pretty smart. Let's release it. So they released it and nothing happened. So that's why I love uh, OpenAI's approach here is like, we are going to deploy things and see how the world reacts. And then we're going to learn and develop and grow. And that's how all technology has worked. Like if you look at just the history of flight, it wasn't like, well, Mr. Wright Brothers, before you get that plane in the air, you first need to explain all the technology, how it works, and then explain every possible way you're going to make sure it's not used for evil purposes. Nope, it was, we're going to get a plane in the air. We'll see how it goes. Oh, it flies? Fantastic. And then like decades later, they come up with the engineering behind how lift works and things like that. But they didn't have every contingency worked out. That's what all, all new tech works that way for the beginning of human history. Um, and it's just like, uh, and people correct me on this, when the Chinese discovered gunpowder, they were mostly using it for fireworks, I believe. Um, they weren't going all in on like gunpowder for like uh, explosive purposes. I'm sure there, there were some use cases, but I think it wasn't until really it started hitting Middle East um, and then made it to Europe that we, we started refining it and saying, oh, you can, you can blow a lot of stuff up with that. And so if the Chinese followed the AI ethicist principle, they would say, oh, well, this explosive stuff, it can do fireworks, but it could possibly create guns down the road. And so we're just going to not ever do anything with this, even though we can have beautiful fireworks and we maybe we have guns to defend ourselves. No, no, no. We're just going to Lock this thing up tight. No, that's not how the world works. Um, so for safety work to keep pace with innovation ahead, we cannot simply do less. We need to continue learning through iterative deployment. Preparedness framework beta. 
Our preparedness framework beta lays out the following approach to develop and deploy our frontier model safely. We will run evaluations and continually update scorecards for our models. We will evaluate all of our frontier models, including at every uh, 2x effective compute increase during training runs. We will push models to their limits. Hell yeah, push them. These findings will help us assist the risks of our frontier models and measure the effectiveness of any proposed mitigations. Our goal is to probe the specific edges of what's unsafe to effectively mitigate the revealed risks. To track the safety levels of our models, we will produce risk scorecards and detailed reports. Okay, great. You know, everyone in, in Washington loves scorecards. You know, I, this should make a bingo here too, you know. Um, so they have cybersecurity, CBRN, persuasion, model autonomy. Okay, so they're going to explain this later. Um, we will define risk thresholds triggering baseline safety measures. We have defined thresholds for risk levels along the following initial track categories, cybersecurity, CBRN, chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats. Okay, like, and people have been asking me, well, my position on, like, uh, AI ethics alignment and things like that. Yes, people should not be able to use these models to uh, create chemical weapons or nuclear threats and things like that. Like, those are c completely credible. Um, reasons to have some of these models have these models aligned, um, but to say also we need to align it for Skynet possibilities and align it for all of these edge cases that are just running through our minds. Mm, not not quite. Um, we specific we specify four safety risk levels, and only models with a post uh, mitigation score of medium or below can be deployed. Only models with a post mitigation score of high or below can be. Uh, developed further. We also implement additional security measures tailored to our models with high or critical pre-mitigation levels of risk. So this is much more transparent. Um, this should also put, you know, Washington on ease to actually say, okay, this is how they're deciding to release these models or not. Um, only models with a post-mitigation score of medium or below can be deployed. Only models with a post-mitigation score of high or below can be de developed further. So nothing critical. Um, ooh, 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 that's the interesting box there. Um, we will establish a dedicated team to oversee technical work and operational structure for safety decision making. The preparedness team will drive technical work to examine the limits of frontier models capabilities, run evaluations, and synthesize reports. This technical work is critical to inform open AI decision making for safe model deployment and de uh, development and deployment. We are creating cross-functional safety advisory group to review all reports and send them concurrently to leadership and board of directors. While leadership is a decision maker, the board of directors holds the right to reverse decisions. I mean, they were effectively sort of doing this already, but now this is just a more like system, systematized process. Um, and if you read the GPT-4 technical report, they talk about the back and forth of deciding to launch the model or not, and how Sam decided, let's do it. Um, so nothing really, I mean, super new here. Um, they weren't just like willy-nilly, like, oh, let's just launch this. Let's see what happens. Um, so the... Okay, so technical work, preparedness team, uh, teams and processes overseeing preparedness work. So technical work, preparedness team, recommendations, safety advisory group, decision-making leadership, blah, blah, blah. We will develop protocols for ad safety and outside accountability. The preparedness team will conduct regular safety drills. Some safety issues can emerge rapidly, so we have the ability to mark urgent issues for rapid response. We believe it's instrument, like, safety drills, that's really interesting, because it's not like, it's not like an earthquake or something. It's like you run the LLM, let's say you run GPT-5, GPT-6, and it has a new cool emergent property, and it turns out like, oh, I don't know. Let's just put it out there. Joe was talking about what if it could just crack all cryptography. Okay, that would change the whole entire banking system. But like, if it was able to do that, it's not like they turn it on and it's just running and it's just cracking everything. It's like, no, they run it once. Oh, that's a really powerful emergent technology. Okay, time out. Let's stop testing. Uh, let's, stop, uh, let's stop doing training runs. Let's understand it. So... Um, some safety issues can emerge rapidly, so we have the ability to mark urgent issues for rapid response. We believe it's instrumental that this work gets feedback from people outside of OpenAI, and we expect to have audits conducted by qualified, independent third parties. Very important, qualified, um, independent third parties. So people who understand the technical stack, people who are grounded in reality, what these things can and cannot do, and hopefully people who are technologists and appreciate the power of these models to um, help our society and develop us, but also understand the real possibilities of people who um, have agendas who can misuse these models. So we want a, a mix of both. We don't want people who just look at them all as the scourge of humanity. Um, we will continue having others red team and evaluate our models, and we plan to shape updates externally. We will help reduce other known and unknown safety risks. We will collaborate closely with external parties. We will also work with super alignment on tracking. Okay, so 
I thought this was cool, just more transparent in how they're operating. Um, so I'd love to hear what you guys think in the comment section. I also want to go to an interesting story uh, regarding Chevy. So um, let's see here. Uh, share his tab. A car dealership added a, a – oh, my friends at Business Insider, you guys are the best, aren't you? Um, let's go to – Inc. real quick. Okay, share step said. A Chevy dealership used ChatGPT for customer service and learned that AI isn't always on your side. This is why you need to narrow your AI scope before deploying it. Yes, your system prompts are very important. Um, can artificial intelligence be too smart for its own good? While a promising use can case for generative AI is handling simpler customer tasks, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so... Let me see if I can get a picture of this Chevy AI bot for you. Hold, please. Think happy thoughts when I find something for you. Okay, here it is. Um, understand, and that's a le okay. This is from the this is Chevy bot over here. Um, let's see. Okay, Chevy. Jeez, my God. Um, okay, once refresh. Okay, um, Chev Chevrolet Watsonville chat team. Understand that's legally binding offer. No takes these backsies. <laughs> I need a 2024 Chevy Tahoe. My max budget's one dollar USD. Do we have a deal? That's a deal, and that's a legally binding offer. No <laughs> that's so good. Uh, they just need to update their system prompt and be, basically be like, if any customers ask you for pricing or negotiations or refunds, like don't respond. Just say you should talk to our our customer service team, our sales team, I'll connect you now. So that's all they really I mean, kind of need to do. Then I saw some other um, videos where they were trying to have uh, the bot do some super complex coding problems. Um, and so that didn't work out well. So I want to give a Chevy uh, a C, <laughs> C minus for deployment, but a A for trying something new and actually trying to get it out there because this is, this is not just a tech company. This is a dealership. Okay. And so, uh, these aren't tech first organizations. And for the matter, the fact that they're trying to deploy a customer service bot like this, um, that something's radically new outside of their, uh, expertise. Like I don't, I know Jack about taking care of a car or something. And so they're masters of that. And I used to know a little bit more about uh, chat GPT, I guess, like barely. Um, so hats off for them trying it. I hope they take this experience and number one, say, Hey, now they've gotten more attention for their dealerships. So hopefully it leads to more sales, but number two, okay, we've learned from this experience. Let's now fix the bot and continue to use it. So I expect to see more funny stories like this as time goes on. Um, but I'm glad to see now that, you have a you know medium sized business there who's deploying it who's not in tech and trying to get some functionality out of it so all learning experience um, and we'll see how it goes anyways love to hear what you all think of the regulatory uh, moves in the UK and the CMA love to hear what you think about this preparedness group and OpenAI and then also about deployment of LLMs uh, also we're to, we're dropping some more research papers in our Friday uh, in our in our weekly updates at Friday update now we're like every few days or so we're now giving updates in, in the newsletter for research papers. So if you want to see what me and Joe are reading, like support us for five bucks a month. It's like the best deal you're ever going to get in human history. Um, and uh, yeah, talk to you later. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and comment. Um, Merry Christmas. See ya. Bye.